So our last talk in this session is from Robin Ledbeater, who's going to talk about dissecting comets with spectroscopy. And I think this is one of the areas of astronomy that amateurs have been huge developments uh, over the last few years and amateur capability of actually taking really high quality spectroscopic observations of objects. I'm really looking forward to this talk. So Robin, over to you. Okay, thank you, Nick. And uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think quite a few of you probably know that I'm uh, somewhat uh, obsessed by spectroscopy. Uh, if it's up there and reflecting or uh, emitting light, I will try to take a spectrum of it. And that leads to some pretty eclectic mix of targets. <laughs> In fact, uh, for example, do you know that the light reflected from the James Webb Space Telescope is in fact pink. <laughs> and at the other end, uh, looking at light from the early universe, um, light from uh, material spiraling into supermassive black holes uh, and emitting in the ultraviolet and stretched by cosmological expansion uh, to over five and a half times its wavelength uh, over that 12.4 billion years to arrive in my telescope in the red part of the spectrum. But you only have to look as a spectroscopist at a, at a comet, an image of a comet, this one 2020 F3 Neowise by some guy called Nick James. And uh, you can see uh, light reflected from the dust, sunlight. You can see an eerie glow round the coma and you can see an uh, eerie green glow and then an, a blue ethereal glow in the iron tail, all potentially targets for the spectroscopist to try and understand more about what's going on in these remarkable objects. Okay, so how do we go about taking a spectrum of a comet? Well, one of the easiest ways is to just take a camera with a lens on the front and stick a diffraction grating on the front of it and take an image. Uh, here's a, uh, one of my astro cameras with a 50mm uh, SLR lens on the front and mounted in a lens cap on the front is a uh, 200 lines per millimetre star analyzer diffraction grating. And if you take an image uh, of a field with a comet, you see something like that. Uh, I'm very embarrassed by the sky background compared with Thomas's previous slide, um, but it was a, uh, a bright moon. Uh, and you get something like that. So some of the light through goes straight through the diffraction grating and produces a normal image. And we can see our tiny comet just here, uh, 2013 R1 Lovejoy. Uh, but all the stars in the, uh, in the image also produce spectra. And most stars, and in fact, most solar system objects, uh, planets, moons, asteroids, space telescopes, they all produce uh, a continuous spectrum, a line. Uh, but our comet is quite different. Uh, we have a faint line all the way through, but what the eye is drawn to are these bright blobs. And what we're looking at in this spectrum is blue on the left end through to red on the right. And we're looking at bright blobs at particular wavelengths. And if we do this with a color camera, as James Waitman did, uh, again, this time with 2020 F3, um, you can see that the brightest blobs are in the blue-green. And this is where our blue-green glow that we see around the coma is coming from. Now, we can take this spectrum, we can digitize it and produce a graph, uh, something like this. So we have wavelength along the bottom in Angstrom's. Uh, violet on the left up to in just into the infrared on the right and what we see is we have a, a continuous curve underneath which is the scattered sunlight off the dusk dust but on top of that we have a series of very intense emission bands and from the wavelength we can identify what substances are producing these and these are produced by fragments of molecules. Now I say fragments because what they are, are what happens is um, uh, substances get uh, evaporated off the nucleus of the comet 
and these are more complex molecules, but they quickly get broken down in the sunlight uh, into these sort of uh, molecular fragments. And you can see on the far left, we have CN, right, and that's right on the boundary between, uh, via, between visible and ultraviolet spectrum. Uh, and then we have a series of uh, bands from C2. These are the swan bands, and these are the bright blue-green blobs we see uh, that give the coma that uh, green uh, emission colour. And then further into red, we see fainter some other bands, and they're from NH2. Now, this is just a selection of the uh, molecular fragments you can find in the, in the visible spectrum. Uh, and here's a list that uh, lists probably most of them, the most common, certainly. The first list is all the neutral ones, OHCN. We've got C2, C3, that's actually in there, but I haven't marked it. CH, NH, NH2, and the forbidden line of oxygen. And then we have a second column, and these are the ions, positively charged ions, uh, molecular fragments with a, an electron missing. And these uh, are swept into the tail by the, uh, swept along by the solar wind, charged solar wind. And then in the third column on its own, we've got Na, sodium. Now, you sometimes find that in comets, but it's fairly rare because comets have to, to produce sodium, the comet has to get close enough to the sun for sodium to be, start being liberated. Uh, and uh, so we need a comet that gets close to the sun. But when they're close to the sun, they're usually difficult to see because they haven't got a very good, good elongation. So it's only uh, the occasional comet we actually get to see uh, sodium in. Now, 2020 F3 was one that uh, potentially had the opportunity to, for us to have a look at, uh, at sodium. Uh, so as soon as it uh, came out from the glare of the uh, sun after uh, perihelion, I had a go at taking a, a spectrum using the same sort of technique. Now, it was very low in the sky, very, very bright uh, sky background. Um, but you can see, if I can get the pointer, you see the little zero order, the, the light that goes straight through the grating, little comet there with its tail. You see the power lines that I have in the field of view. You can see a continuous spectrum there, or you can see you can see clouds, and, and these are not to loosen clouds, actually. It was a spectacular evening, but not best for taking comet spectra. Uh, you can see a, a sort of a continuous spectrum from the dust, and you can see a bright spot just there. And that's at the exact wavelength where we would expect sodium emission to be. That's the sodium D line, which is the famous one you get from low pressure sodium street lamps, though there aren't so many of those around. Uh, and if we blow it up and make a negative image, I think you can just about make out a little tiny sodium tail. And in fact, the next day, um, uh, professional astronomers using uh, uh, narrow band imaging uh, were able to uh, detect this uh, sodium tail. That's Jeff Morgenthaler and Carl Schmidt at the Planetary Science Institute. Interestingly, they used a, a setup which they normally use for looking at sodium uh, cloud around uh, Io, which is Jupiter's moon Io. And if you look in the uh, BAA journal, this, this last one, then uh, uh, David Boyd shows how to detect uh, Io's sodium cloud. About a week later, Torsten Hansen did something similar to me. The comet was higher in the sky and it was a darker, much darker sky background. So he took this beautiful image using a, a star analyzer and a DSLR. And you can see, this is the image of the comet. And you can see here a really nice sodium tail. The rest of it is this continuous spectrum of the dust, but then the sodium tail looks really clear. Now the way that sodium tail develops is quite interesting. It's different from the iron tail, where the charged ions are streamed away uh, in the solar wind. What's happening here is the um, photons of light in the uh, solar spectron spectrum are being absorbed by the sodium atoms and then re-emitted to produce this bright emission. But those photons also carry momentum, so they give the sodium atoms a kick 
and it's a very efficient process. So these continuous kicks uh, of absorbed uh, photons pushes the uh, sodium uh, atoms out into its own tail. And in fact, the tail is independent of the iron tail and is at a slightly different angle from both the dust tail and the iron tail. Okay, this is okay for bright comets and it's a rough, quick rough uh, look at a comet. But if you want to look at uh, fainter comets and we want to look at them in more detail, then we need a spectrograph on a telescope to collect more light. And we need a slip spectrograph so we can select a particular part of the uh, comet. These are my two slit spectrographs. Uh, they cover a wide range of resolutions, uh, all the way down to from 45 angstroms resolution with the Alpi spectrograph, all the way up to uh, sub angstrom resolution with the Lyres. Now, the problem is with comets, uh, they tend to be rather faint. They also are extended objects, so the amount of light that actually gets through the slit is only a fraction of the, the total light in some cases. Uh, so we tend to work most of the time uh, at low resolution. So it's the Alpi spectrograph you'll see the results from for most of this talk. Um, we can go reasonably faint, faintish, magnitude 10 to 14 with that setup with the Alpi at its lowest resolution. All these spectra, five, three, five, yes, five spectra were all taken on the same night. I just waited for them to go past the meridian in turn and took an hour on each of them. Uh, but most of them are boring. Four out of five just really show a continuous spectrum of, uh, of off the dust uh, surrounding the coma. A few absorption lines in them from the solar spectrum, of course. But the one on the bottom left there, uh, 104p, uh, you can see the continuous spectrum of the dust near the centre of the coma, uh, but you can see the emission bands that we saw in the simpler spectra uh, radiating out from that central coma. Uh, the slit length is probably around about six arc minutes. So you can see that the, the gas that's producing the green glow in the coma and the CN and the NH2 extend well beyond the region where the dust is. And in fact, with a bright comet, our friend 2020 F3, uh, we can go and put the slit in different positions within, within the comet. Uh, what we're seeing here, this is the guide, the view through the guider built into the spectrograph. So what it is, it's a mirror uh, and in the mirror is etched a very narrow slit where the coating has been removed. So uh, the reflective coating has been removed. It's about three arc seconds wide and about uh, six arc minutes long, something like that. And we can put it through the center of the coma, through the uh, optocenter, uh, and, uh, and then a few arc minutes down the tail. Uh, had to take two take it in two chunks to get the full width right the way across. Uh, and if we do that, we can get, we get spectra, spectrum images looking like that. So I've put a scale on the side to say how far away from the center of the, co uh, center of the coma, how far away from the, the nucleus effectively we, we're looking. This is uh, wavelength along here. Uh, and this is the coma, and this is a cross section through the whole tail, the two results uh, stitched together. And we can see something in common. Here's sodium, very bright in the tail, and also there bright in the center of the coma. We can see right at this end, here's our CN on the boundary between the uh, visible and the ultraviolet. Uh, but the rest of it looks rather different. Uh, here are our, in the coma, are our friends, the, the swan bands, the C2 swan bands. Uh, but they're completely absent in the tail, no sign of it there. Instead, we have a series of double lines. Now, what we can do now is, starting with this as a start point, we can now start dissecting our comet. We have a, some slices through it, and we can use the, we're using the slit as a, as a scalpel, if you like, and have, have taken slices through the comet. 
So how do we go about processing these to get extract all the information out? Well, the first thing we do is uh, take the uh, a spectrum of the inner comma part, just the, just the inner part, uh, and produce a conventional spectrum. Uh, what I've done is uh, all the things that you need to do to produce a spectrum. You have to remove the sky background. You have to uh, calibrate it in wavelength. Uh, and you have to calibrate it in flux here, a relative flux well, rather than absolute. Um, and to do that, you use a standard star uh, as a reference uh, to correct for the uh, sensitivity curve of the instrument and also for atmospheric extinction. And we end up with something like this. And you can see this continuous background continuum from the uh, dust. And in fact, it has some features in it. These, for example, those are the calcium HJ, HK lines in the solar spectrum because everything in that dust spectrum includes all the lines, that, all the Fraunhofer lines we get in the solar spectrum. And then superimposed on that is all our emission lines. So the first thing we want to do is separate out the dust so we can separate the dust spectrum from the uh, emission spectrum. Uh, so of course the, the dust spectrum is effectively just the solar spectrum and this is the spectrum of the sun. Uh, but it's modified because the, uh, the dust doesn't reflect or scatter all wavelengths equally. In fact, what it does is it tends to redden the solar spectrum. So you get a, a redder light off the, off the uh, dust. So we have to work out the dust reflectance curve that's going to fit this curve in the, in the comet spectrum. And we multiply the solar spectrum by the dust reflectance spectrum and we get the dust contribution. And we can overlay that dust contribution on top of our total spectrum. And you can see it nicely fits that curve underneath, including all the things like uh, all the Fraunhofer lines. That's the MG triplet, I think, probably. This is the calcium HK lines, which is what that one is. Uh, and then, if we, then we can nicely subtract it uh, and end up with the emission spectrum from the coma, central region of the coma, and our dust reflectance spectrum. Now you can see here we've got, uh, I've identified some of the, uh, the molecular fragments, CN. Here we've got C3 now, very odd, uh, almost coxcomb-like spectrum. CN again, different wavelengths, CH, C2 swan bands, very strong sodium line, and then NH2 through here. So there are some actually some weak C2s in here as well. So that's our emission spectrum of the central region of the coma. Uh, we can do exactly the same thing with the tail spectrum. Uh, we can start off with an average spectrum across the width of the tail. Uh, and we can subtract the dust from that in the same way, and we get the tail emission spectrum. And you can see CN, NAD, and we now can determine what these uh, interesting sets of double lines are. These are actually from CO plus, and it's CO plus in the blue, which gives the tail, iron tail, its blue color. Okay, so we've, we've if you like, dissected the comet into different, uh, uh, different properties or different uh, components, but because we have the uh, spectrum measured all the way across the, the along the length of the uh, um, of the slit, we could do this at any position out from the out from the centre of the coma. We could go right away out, uh, or we could go in different positions across the tail. And in fact, that's what we'll do. Uh, this is where the slit was it was here across the coma and here across the tail and the spectra i've just shown were just in this little area between the two lines for the coma and the average here but what we can do is we can take spectra any way we like along here and we can start looking at how these various substances are distributed across the across the uh, comet and this is what we get this is um distribution of the various components now taken across the 
coma and across the tail, 130,000 kilometers down from the nucleus. And if we look at them, uh, we see the red is dust, and that's quite tightly confined close to the uh, center, close to the nucleus, close to the center of the coma, in the coma. But if you look at it in the tail, you see it's widened out considerably and it has a dip in the middle. And that's the formation of this bifurcation of the, of the tail, the dusty tail there, just starting. So we're looking at the root of the tail here. Uh, it extends, you know, way off. Um, if you look at the sodium, you can see that's even tighter across the coma, very tight in, in the middle here. But if you look at it in the tail, we can see it streamed out into the tail. So we see it's a long way down the, long way down the tail, but very narrow across the coma. And you can also see it's slightly offset to the left, anti-clockwise, relative to the dust. And that shows it's forming its separate tail. The dust is going one way, the tail's going the other. The, the, the sodium's going the other. Here's C2, that's fairly tight in still, that's the green glow. And then further out, we see CN, that's even widely spread. And if we look in the tail, we don't see C2 at all. There's no C2 there. The C2 is limited to this region round here. And in instead, we get the CO, the uh, ionized uh, material, which has been swept by the uh, solar wind. If we look at the CN, down the tail here, it's extremely broad. In fact, it's gone off the edges of the slit. So it's right out here. So it's, the CN starts here and it radiates out at a very shallow angle, fans out. And it covers, although you can't see it in the guider image, it's all the way out here. And CN, you never see CN in, in images, uh, and yet it's, it's everywhere. It's uh, over vast uh, regions of the comet. I guess because most images don't actually go down that way for a file. Um, if you think RGB, um, the B doesn't cover down at 3850 angstroms or whatever it is. Most of the images don't cut off. Yeah, so you don't see that. There's a whole comet that you don't see there. Now it's difficult because it is very spread out and it is, although it's intense in the spectrum, it's, it's rather weak. But there is a whole world that we don't see in images. Okay. Okay, so let's compare. That's a sample of one. Let's compare another comet. Um, I don't have any more tail uh, spectra to show you. You need a bright comet for that, and we haven't had one. But uh, 2020 R4, um, here's the uh, spectrum of the coma in the same way. Uh, we can analyze it in the same way. Um, here's its inner coma spectrum. But if we overlay the coma for 2020 F3 on top of it, we well, can see some interesting differences. Here I've normalized the spectra so the CN line is the same height. Uh, we see the sodium in 2020 F3, but not in uh, R4 because it was too far away from the sun. Um, you, but you can see that in uh, R4, C3 is much stronger but C2 is much weaker. So we're seeing differences between these two comets. Now it might be just, a, oh, and in fact, if we, if we look at the distributions, uh, we see a difference as well. The dust is very fine, very defined in R4, but C2 and CN have the same sort of distribution in R4, whereas they were quite different uh, in, uh, in, in, F3, in F3. Now, if we compare them one with another, the dust is identical, almost identical. The distribution is the same in both these, F3 and F4 and R4. Uh, but CN is broader in R4 than it is in uh, F3. And the difference is even more striking with the C2 swan bands, uh, very tightly defined uh, area in the center in F3, but much broader uh, in R4. Now, it could be just differences between comets. They're all different and we've got only two of them. But I suspect uh, it's more to do with the distance from the sun. Uh, the, difference is, uh, the difference in the solar flux because of the difference in distance 
is something like 12 times. So R4 is receiving less than 10% of the flux that uh, F3 had. And that's going to delay the decomposition of those complex molecules that uh, evaporated off the nucleus into these fragments and then delay the decay of these fragments into uh, uh, simpler uh, fragments which we don't see in the visible spectrum. Okay, so that's a complete dissection of uh, 2020 F3, uh, both into its uh, chemical components and also into the distribution of those. Now, I think it's, it's um, the study of that distribution is complex. The modeling of it involves hydrodynamics and uh, photochemistry, which is well beyond my pay grade. Uh, but I think it's interesting that uh, with relatively simple equipment as amateurs, we can actually start to get a handle, a handle on those sort of processes that are going on. And with that, I better stop. Thank you, Robin. That, that's great stuff. From an image's point of view, it's just amazing to see how you can do that dissection so, so sort of thoroughly using spectroscopy. Um, so uh, any questions for Robin? We've got a bit of time for any questions.